Hello and welcome. Welcome back to the Elevated Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa. I'm the Elevated Empath on Instagram and TikTok, and I am so excited that you're here. I'm so excited. We're going to be starting the Elevated Podcast finally. Finally. What the moment we've all been waiting for. No one's waiting. No one's been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this. I'm so excited that you're here. This is going to be a community of elevated empaths, empaths who harness and embrace their empathic superpowers, unleash their duality, and live from their true authentic soul energy, which is wild and free and sexy and empowered. I'm so excited that you're here. So today... We're going to open it up. We're going to continue this conversation. If you've seen my article on Medium about the war on censoring sex on the internet, you kind of already know about this, but I'm going to continue that conversation today. We're going to go through the article, add things that maybe, you know, I was thinking behind as I was writing it and didn't mention because it was a long article. I didn't want to make it too long. I wanted to make it accessible but I want to talk about it a little bit more because it was a piece that I was really proud of and really excited about. It combines all my favorite things, sex, social media, law, politics, sex workers, and my history working in law enforcement for a top head company. So we're going to get into it today. Before that, make sure you like, share, subscribe because this is going to be an ongoing conversation and I'm just really excited. I'm so excited. This is going to be so good. And I I hope that, you know, you can learn something and I really want to know what you think. You know, if you totally disagree with me, I want to know. If you totally agree with me, I also want to know. But this is a conversation and, you know, I say a, a, a few kind of controversial things that you can't approach sex and censorship on the internet without being controversial. So I would love to hear what you think. I want to keep it open and, you know, a discussion. So I'm really excited that you're listening and I hope that we can, you know, I don't know, learn something together. You know that as the Elevated Empath, if you follow me anywhere, you know that sexuality is my specialty and I love talking about it because I think it's a hallmark of embracing our soul and our body and our spirit all in one. It's kind of a hallmark of our health and our mental health and I just really love to talk about it because I think it helped me kind of understand myself in a lot of different ways and so we'll talk about, you know, all of that. I think that'll be another episode of me kind of coming into my understanding of sexuality, you know, over time. Today, let's talk about this censorship thing, you know, because I don't know if you've like seen on Instagram or TikTok, just people, you know, these platforms getting really ruthless about taking down sexual or suggestive content. We're going to take a look at it and why this is happening. And so if you've noticed it and had questions, boy, do I have you covered. So let's, let's start. Let's start here. When you, if you're not driving or doing something important that requires your eyes, just close your eyes and think about the word war and battles and what does it look like in your head? You know, usually we've, you can pull up, you've pulled up something that looks like guns and bombs and people shooting at each other. And it looks, that's what war typically looks like. If you think about war centuries ago, we think of bows and arrows and, you know, the American revolution, whatever it is, these archaic weapons. So if you think about the way that weapons have evolved over time, and you think about what the greatest weapon in our society right now is, it would be information and technology. Even though, you know, typical like bombs and guns and that type of war still exists, the greatest weapon that we have right now is the information about those wars or about technology. And so we've clearly kind of evolved past this loss of life and weapons as our primary form of war. And I would say that the civil war that we're experiencing in the U.S. today is over the the war on censorship. 
and the consumption and distribution of information. We've seen big tech, you know, censor the president and censor all types of things. And since COVID happened, you know, there's so many regulations on the information being spread about COVID. They flag everything that has something related to the disease and they've started to delete sex education and they've started to delete, you know, conspiracy theorists for harassment and bullying. So there's fewer places that we can freely express our thoughts without feeling unsafe. And you can argue that these things shouldn't be on the internet. We'll get into that. (laughs) If you think that, you know, um, these things should be censored. That's a totally different conversation. I'm not going to get into the politics of it, of, you know, the the political censorship. That's not why we're here today. That's a whole different conversation. We can have that conversation, but it's not today. I've personally been censored for talking about sex or masturbation online. We'll get into that as well. Um, We're not going to talk about politics today. We're going to talk about the sex on the internet being censored and even more than it had been before. Um, And we're going to talk about why we're kind of taking these steps backwards. So let me give you some background. If you don't know me or you haven't really followed me for that long, um, I worked on a law enforcement response team for a top tech company. And essentially, anytime someone did something naughty or a crime on this app, law enforcement, detectives, FBI, you know, any type of law enforcement would come to our team and request information to help them in their investigation with the right legal process and all of that. So to put it simply, (laughs) I have seen the darkest corners of the internet, some might say. I've witnessed the most disturbing crimes, and that was on a daily basis and consistently for eight hours a day, every day. And I can safely tell you that sex education, these things that are being put on the internet that are being taken down, any suggestive content is doesn't even scratch the surface of the terrible crimes that actually happen on the internet. And if you don't know much about my practice, I own my own coaching business that involves, you know, sex education, sexual health, the holistic approach to coaching and embracing one's sexuality. And so I've created TikToks about incorporating masturbation in your self-care routine, the connection between manifestation and orgasms and sex and navigating sex as an empath because that's a whole other conversation. And I've gotten most of those TikToks taken down, including a TikTok about celebrities being old souls and then I, you know, they restore them after I fiercely appeal. So I'll walk, I'll walk through those, those TikToks that they were taken down and, you know, how I, how we navigated a compromise, me and TikTok. I'll give you some background on these TikToks that have been taken down. The first one was about incorporating masturbation in your self-care routine, about how it's a releasing of pent up energy, you know, from a mind, body, soul perspective. That one was taken down and I was, this was kind of before I got into the, you know, we start spelling sexy S-E-G-G-S-Y on TikTok so that it won't get taken down. So this was before I knew how to do all of that. So I said like masturbation everywhere. And so obviously it got taken down and then I fiercely appealed. I was like, what in the fuck are you doing? And I essentially was like, I know what you're dealing with over there. I know what you're looking at. This doesn't even scratch the surface. And I fiercely appeal. (laughs) And then they restore it. And they're like, they're usually my best performing videos too. The reason why I fiercely appeal is because I've gotten so many wonderful clients from TikTok. And it's important to me that, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seen on that platform And they're my best performing videos, you know? 
So there was that one. There was another sex and the empath one. The one that was kind of crazy was I was talking about Lana Rhodes and Oprah being old souls. And that one got taken down first for harassment and bullying. And then when I, like a week later after I had appealed, nothing came through yet. And then I looked at it again and then it said adult nudity and sexual activity. So they had changed the reason. And I was trying to reach out to them and understand why. I just re-uploaded the video because I was like, fuck you. And, (laughs) And then that one also got taken down. And so I appealed both of them. One of them was rejected and one of them was approved and restored. They're the exact same video. (laughs) So there's an inconsistency with the censorship, which I, you know, I'm speaking from my personal experience. This is the case, you know, on a, in aggregate as well. So I'm speaking from personal experience, but this is the case for most people. So as let's, we'll back up for a little bit. I'm talking about my experience. Let's back up to what's happened in censorship. When COVID hit a year ago, oh my God, we had to stay in our homes, little in-person interaction. Our our only form or primary form of interaction with people was through the internet and social media. And so it made our, made that the most powerful tool in our new way of living. We're consuming or crap or manipulated or crafted content. We're not getting the full story. And we saw prime examples of this. It's 2020 carried on the deception and the twisted truths and the glamorizing and the all, you know, the, the fake news and all of that stuff kind of became the norm. And we kind of saw that we couldn't trust everything. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, um, those are the main ones. Google, I guess, but we won't get into that. Um, I'm just going to talk about mostly Instagram and TikTok since since those are the primary apps that are going through this right now, even though the other ones are, and I have more experience working with those. So we're going to just talk about those. I know Twitter is a whole different story. I don't even want to get into Twitter. You know what I mean? I don't want to get into Twitter. It's a whole, I don't even want to say the name Twitter, to be honest with you. Um, Clearly, I have very strong opinions about Twitter. But we won't get into that. Um, they're becoming ruthless about removing sexual and suggestive content. They're, they introduce newer and harsher community guidelines. It seems monthly, weekly, daily almost. Um, but they but their terms are so vague and simple that it doesn't explain why they take certain things down. Like I said, they took mine down for adult nudity and sexual activity. I'm clothed up to my neck. Um, the only reason that I can, can think of is because I'm talking about Lana Rhodes, who in a green screen behind me is wearing a bikini, but there are a lot of women who wear bikinis on TikTok. CNMA for being an example of somebody who's not only verified, but has like what, 15 million followers. None of her bikini videos are taken down. So... The other thing I can think of is because I'm talking about Lana Rhodes, who's a former adult actress. There was, there's also no explanation for how that fits into adult nudity and sexual activity. That's all they say, adult nudity and sexual activity. There's no, you know, justification for the removal or anything like that. They, you know, TikTok and Instagram are also being really ruthless about using the words only fans, you know, (laughs) or providing any access to swipe up links. Sex workers just like create convoluted ways to get around that, um, which work. And so it it defeats the purpose. It's just stupid. It just makes them create new ways of getting to their only fans content. And they've started to remove sex workers from the platform altogether, which we'll talk about. These attempts and these regulations are not new. They just seem to be harsher and more intense. And I, you know, I think back on in 2018 when Lana Rhodes was like crying and begging for her Instagram back. She wasn't even doing adult content, if I can remember, 2018. I don't think she was doing adult content at that point. Um, when I say adult content, I mean porn. She was still doing adult content. But they, Instagram like took her a countdown because of, you know, suggestive pictures, of course, but nothing that 
other Instagram models aren't doing, you know, posting in bikinis or like half naked or mostly naked, but covering everything. And, you know, she was <laughs> crying and begging for her Instagram back, which seemed dramatic to a lot of people, but it was her primary form of income. It's the way she gets brand deals and, you know, it's her, her central location of drawing in an audience, especially before TikTok took off. So why don't we just go to TikTok? Oh, let me tell you why we don't just go to TikTok. TikTok's even worse, I think, about censoring content. I think Instagram is targeting sex workers for sure. (laughs) But sex educators, I think they allow a little bit more uh, growth there, but certainly not for sex workers. They're really ruthless about sex workers on both platforms. The content that's being uploaded and regulated, especially on TikTok, you know, men aren't censored as much as women are. I will give you very clear examples of this. There's a few. I don't want to call them out. Yeah, I do want to call them out. (laughs) Uh, I'm thinking about Garrett Nolan, who's like fucking verified and like posts these videos of him like I'm just thinking of this one video in, in particular. He's like just has like a kitchen towel over his balls and like that was left up. It's, he's not only those videos aren't no, not only left up, but he's verified by TikTok themselves. I'm like clothed up to my neck talking about celebrities being with old souls and I get that taken down. I, I also don't get as nearly as much visibility as he does. So What's the reason for this chaotic, inconsistent censorship? So let's get into the meat of it. It's the it's this increase in legislation being put forward by the Senate, you know, bipart- bipartisanly to protect vi- children and victims of sexual abuse and revenge porn. Um, the latest being the Stop the Internet Sexual Exploitation Act. It's bipartisan legislation put forward by the Senate in 2020, uh, December 2020. So recently, in an effort to regulate sex content and uh, child porn, essentially, is the point of it, right? And don't get me wrong, I have a very deep, 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 deep understanding of the copious amounts of child porn and revenge porn and Um, sexual harassment online because of my job. I have a very good understanding of that. Um, But this act is, uh, I think, creates more issues than it does good, to be honest. Um, So I want to get into it because if you're any, if you're at all interested in the way that this all works, you know, think about the way that these senators are creating these policies, you know, they don't really have a deep understanding of the nuances of sex work, you know, or the amount of child porn or what is actually happening on on the internet. So it's a nine page act, which I think uh, doesn't really cover the complexities of what's happening on the internet. And there's a couple points, there's like six points, which I, I want to go through because this is just like, it's just not going to create a balance. It's actually going to force platforms to not allow any suggestive content at all. And so they're just going to do away with it altogether instead of creating like a healthy balance essentially. And so we're going to take like 10 steps back, right? So first, the act requires any platform that hosts pornography to require the user to verify their identity and submit a signed consent form of everyone appearing in the video before uploading content. This requirement is, um, I think, a pretty common practice, but if there are sex workers who don't want their real name out there or anything like that, it puts sex workers at risk because it essentially... Um, forces them to confirm their real identity, allowing law enforcement an easier way to track sex workers in a database. Second, the, 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 the act requires these platforms. So when I say platforms, I'm talking Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, you know, we're going to get into the whole platform versus publisher debate, but 
that'll come later. Um, it requires these platforms to have an easy access point on their website that instructs people how to request a removal of a video if the, if the individual hasn't consented to it being uploaded. I was, when I was working in with law enforcement in, at this top tech company, I was really curious. I was like, I wonder if Pornhub has any team like this. Cause that would be cool. I'm thinking to myself, like that would be cool to like work for Pornhub and like do this work for Pornhub, even though it would be like twice as disturbing, if not the same. Um, and so I was looking into it and I was really shocked to learn that there really wasn't any way of contacting law enforcement about something on Pornhub or really any trust and safety site. And only in tw April 2020 did they decide to hire outside experts to clean up their site and make it compliant. And so now when you go to Pornhub's commitment of trust and safety, they're taking major steps to further and protect their community. They're only going to allow identified users to upload content. So if you didn't hear about them um, removing all unverified content on Pornhub, what, like millions of videos and banning downloads, um, they launched a trusted flagger program with nonprofit organizations, and now they're partnering, partnering with NICMIC, the, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, and they'll issue their first transparency report. Okay. <laughs> it's so crazy to me that Pornhub is just now doing all of this. It, it, it was crazy to me when I was working there that I couldn't find anything. I'm like, what are they doing? They're just letting anyone upload content. That's so, that's not good. So a transparency report, going back to that, it discloses any data or information. Um, essentially, it's them being like, this is what we did to protect our community. This is how many things we reported. Um, these are kind of the areas of the world that we were, you know, reporting from and like what types of crimes were reported, all of that. And then they were, you know, work with the NICMIC, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, to, you know, protect their communities. The fact that Pornhub is doing their first transparency report in 2021 is astonishing. I don't know if that's just me that feels that way. I think it's so crazy. Okay, third. The act states that the video downloads are prohibited to prevent the circulation of content. Um... As long as there's a work, not a workaround with screen recording or anything like that, it's it's a good inclusion. I don't think it's going to prevent the circulation of content. It's, it essentially makes it a little harder, but people can easily work around that, to be honest. Fourth, and I think it's the most important one, this act is going to require these platforms to have a 24-hour telephone hotline where people can call directly to the staff and request the removal of content. In addition to that, the content needs to be taken down within two hours of the request. Okay. <laughs> you know how I feel um, about this. You don't? I'll tell you. <laughs> so the amount of requests that these companies deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is insane. Is insane. Uh, whatever you want to call it, trust and safety, law enforcement, content moderation. What else is it called? Policy enforcement at all these different companies. These companies deal with the craziest amounts of volume. They have to hire so many people to cover it. And even then, they have, like, a pretty big backlog, usually. So, a 24-hour telephone hotline, first of all, is archaic. Second of all, is unrealistic. You'd have to, like, think about it. You'd have to hire people in different countries to cover those 24 hours. You don't want to, like, make everyone in, let's say, Los Angeles cover that 24 hours. You want to hire people in different countries to be able to take you know, cover that 24 hour period. And the two hours, uh, that's uh, unrealistic. <laughs> taking down that m amount of volume and assessing whether, you know, taking that down, um, in two hours is crazy. 
And essentially, it's not an emergency. Um, the way that these companies usually operate, if it's an emergency, they'll get to it, you know, within an hour. Um, there's very little that they can disclose about it. But usually this doesn't, this type of stuff doesn't fall under emergency. I know that's crazy to think. <laughs> it's crazy to think about. Um, if somebody is like, has a video of them uploaded and they report it, that's not really considered an emergency in terms of, you know, my, the work that I used to do. So two hours is kind of crazy. Anyways, staffing a hotline, staffing this to keep up with this amount of, um, requests would impose a huge cost on to these companies that they're simply just not going to prioritize during a pandemic. I think that's the biggest point here and the kind of the craziest one that just makes them look a little uneducated about what they're putting forward. Sixth, the sixth point here, the, the act instructs the Department of Justice to create a database of people who have indicated that they don't consent to any sexual content of them being distributed online. Okay. Something other companies have a good database of here and there. I don't think there's any central location from the U.S. government. It would allow the DOJ to easily pull up information after a claim has been made, but it doesn't prevent uh, the distribution. So like some things are intended to prevent and some things are intended to be reactive. Um, Again, I don't think it really covers everything. It's hard to cover everything, right? It's kind of hard to kind of make these assessments. Um, And like I said, I have a really deep understanding of, you know, the importance of protecting children, child porn, child exploitation on the internet. There's a lot of it. And I do understand the, the, this, the need to create these safeguards to protect, you know, any victims of sexual abuse or anything like that. There's a lot of it. And we, we definitely need to be, um, as regimented as we can about protecting that. I also have understanding that these issues will, this act will kind of raise issues around, um, sex work and sexual content and freedom of expression online. A nine page act just doesn't cover the complexities. You know, um, there's a lot of complexities on the internet. So they're a little, these, these regulations are a little far reaching, a little vague. The platforms have a choice. Okay. They can allow sexual content, but regulate it and watch it and decide, okay, well, what are we going to allow? What are we not going to allow? Or they can just do away with it all together and not have to staff these hotlines and all of this stuff. They just take everything down. The cost and implementing these new regulations are going to be a cost and take time and all of these things and have people, you know, train people to make the same call like my video. Two different people were looking at the same video and made different calls. And so there needs to be better training around that. And... The, you know, the companies aren't going to do this. This is not going to be their priority, it, though it should be. There's not going to be like a balanced guidelines around this. So rather than progressing and allowing sex positive and educational and wellness content, the platforms are just going to do away with it altogether. I don't need to em- emphasize the importance of sex education and wellness. I, I will. I think you probably have a good understanding of it. It actually prevents future child molesters and stigmas around sex, shame around sex. It leads to a healthier outlook on sexual expression. When we hide sex positive content or it just makes people feel more shameful. And we're saying that a natural expressive part of our human existence is shameful and shouldn't be expressed. And that leads to even more stigma or, you know, taboo and just shame and um, makes people think that they're even more alone. So they do things behind closed doors and then they, you know, just creates more of that tension. Sex education is let's let's just find, you know, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. Sex education is important, in my opinion. What about sex workers? (laughs) 
a little more controversial to say that sex work is important. I think it is. Sex workers actually allow and create this st- these stigma-free zones of expression. OnlyFans has created this new world for people to monetize their content and create full-ass businesses from their sexual expression. Whether you like small businesses or not, <laughs> these are small businesses. And it's allowed these people to have a business online by expressing themselves sexually. And they actually create shame-free areas on the internet. And so they create these safe spaces for people to express themselves sexually and without judgment. And censoring this is only going to fester more issues of shame around sex and create more further oppression. Let me tell you. Sex work will always find a way on the internet. There's no, there's no other way around it. They're always, they'll always find a way. So let's talk about sex workers on the internet. It's already started to make waves on Instagram. These like new regulations, they, uh, Instagram removed like all top earning, uh, OnlyFans creators all at once (laughs) and sent them the following message. Under our policies, we allow accounts to break our rules a specific number of times before we just move, remove them altogether. We are not able to disclose the number of violations an account is allowed to have. Unfortunately, your account has exceeded this threshold and will be removed. Given your account was removed for repeatedly breaking our community guidelines, we will not be able to reinstate it ever. I added the ever. Okay. <laughs> so all these accounts were taken down at once. It clear like, and they, they're not like they're explicitly saying, we're not going to tell you how many times you like, we can't tell you how many times you broke the rules. AKA. Um, we just decided that you broke the rules too, too many times. We didn't really make a guideline around that. So we just started like creating this new rule. <laughs> exceeded the thresholds. These are new rules and new arbitrary strike number of strikes that will wipe out these sexual accounts without chance of redemption. So it's forced these creators to create new accounts and rebuild their audience. Sex workers are clearly being targeted. Um, They're not taking down these like Instagram models who are posting the same things and the same type of suggestive content. Um, whether it's about like the swipe up link or whatever, it's just, I don't know if it's about this competition between OnlyFans and Instagram. It just seems weird. I, like what else is it about? You know, because they're, I think they're targeting top earning sex workers like Riley Reed and Lena, Lena the plug were particularly, you know, ones that come to mind. There were a lot of others. Let's talk about, let's switch our gears a little bit. And talk about the publisher versus platform debate. This political debate has arised around whether these platforms are allowed to censor whatever they want or if they have to act under, you know, the laws of the government, like the First Amendment. If they're a publisher, they can put they can censor anything they want. They're a publisher. They can do whatever they want. If they're a platform, they have to follow the laws under the U.S the United States of America. Okay. Pretending that these platforms are not platforms, but they're publishers is ridiculous. <laughs> it's naive. They, uh, they operate as platforms. They have, they have so much power. They have billions of users utilizing them as their sole forms of expression on a day-to-day basis. It's unrealistic to consider them publishers. Okay. We've covered that. There are clear loopholes in our laws and big tech's policies. Clear loopholes. The creators of these platforms certainly didn't consider what to do about child pornography as they created these apps. Law Lawmakers were not considering sex workers as they created laws around technology. And the founding fathers certainly did not consider social media when they created the First Amendment. It's a very specific niche. It needs far more understanding and evaluation than just doing away with sex content altogether. These loop, there's so many loopholes. So it will actually actively not protect children and victims. 
we've attempted to censor and regulate sex for centuries. You know, this is, I'm reading sex in the constitution. We've been attempting to censor sex for centuries, you know, since the beginning of time. Nothing about sex in real life has actually changed. Isn't that crazy? Censoring has nothing to do with the way that sex changes. In fact, this might shock you, sex crimes have actually decreased. In the 1970s, this criminology professor at the University of Copenhagen evaluated sex crimes in Denmark, Sweden, and Germany as they legalized pornography in the late 60s and early 70s. There was no correlation between a rise in crime and a decriminalization of porn. Some sex crimes actually fell during this period, like rape and child molestation. There was a compilation of 80 studies in 2009 that concluded a causal link between porn use and sexual violence is slim, and may, at certain times, have been exaggerated by politicians, pressure groups, and some social scientists. That's what the authors wrote. Censoring sex is not going to change sex in real life. But it's also important to know that there, there isn't a correlation between these things. We need to create these safeguards to protect children and victims of sexual exploitation. A a few acts by the Senate doesn't really eliminate the foundational issues around sexual expression. Education is always the base, in my opinion. It's always the base of everything. Easier access to education. Um, (laughs) Someone commented on my TikTok. I think this was on TikTok saying, like, it's crazy that we have to turn to social media to be educational. It is crazy. (laughs) It's crazy that um, we don't teach these things in in schools like we teach kids to just be abstinent we teach them that in like what the eighth grade no we got to keep teaching them in high school and college and all of those things yes we have to not rely on social media for education but it's certainly helpful especially if there are parents who don't talk to you about that type of thing or there's um you have a harder time accessing accessing education so the platforms need to have the support to enforce these regulation and allow for sex education and free expression they they need to open the conversations around the balance of explicit content and educational content really get clear and specify their terms and their community guidelines so we all have a clear understanding of what's allowed and what's not instead of me getting angry and looking at fucking Garrett Nolan and his balls. Just kidding. He's not, he's not nude, but he's mostly nude. (laughs) Just with a kitchen towel on his balls. Like, come on. And I'm not allowed to talk about celebrities with old souls. Like we need just a very clear understanding and implement the resources and counseling for the teams that handle these processes. Oh, that's a juicy one. Implementing counsel and resource resources for the teams that do content moderation, law enforcement, interest and safety. That's a whole other thing. Oh, we won't get into that. Um, but censoring this content doesn't really eliminate the reality of it happening. That goes for politics too. I said I wasn't going to go into it, but um, censoring people doesn't eliminate this reality of them thinking that or them expressing that in their real life you know um we need these platforms to express freely and that shouldn't be a controversial thing to say if you disagree with me you're more than welcome to but we need to be able to express freely and then people can decide what they want to decide about the content if they're like oh that sucks or i don't want to see that there 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 can be I was talking to another creator about this. There needs to be, you know, maybe a 18 plus on TikTok. Like you say that you're 18, you know, even though people are still going to get away around that, there's at least some kind of uh, measures there. Censoring sex won't stop people from distributing and consuming porn. It won't <laughs> certainly won't stop people from having sex. It just might create more shame and taboo, which inevitably leads to more illegal, twisted understandings of sex. Without sex educators, we wouldn't be able to separate hardcore porn with reality. I think a lot of sex educators are like, hey, um, hardcore porn is actually like not realistic. That That's a helpful thing for some people, for most people. 
to understand that we need these sex educators to help us, you know, normalize taboo and normal fantasies and honor the duality instead of shaming them. Um, so we'll start to see the intentions of these platforms is to make money and control information. In my opinion, um, I think we're all kind of waiting for this like new platform. I think we're all kind of moving away from Instagram. We're all going to TikTok, but it's not quite landing you know, the best for everyone, there's going to be a new platform. I think, uh, you know, psychics and tarot readers have actually seen this happening this year. There's going to be a new platform and it's going to, I think the one that's going to rule is going to be somewhere where we can express freely um, and safely, no matter anyone's views. So how far will be too far in censorship? I think we're, we're finding out now. So I want to hear what your thoughts, I want to hear what you think. Did something I say, were you like, what the fuck is she talking about? <laughs> or, you know, did you like things? I want to hear also if you've been censored in some way, or if you know of someone that's being censored, I'm going to do a little bit more research around this and more case studies about who's being censored. I especially want to look at, uh, men not being censored as much as women are. Um, and if like everyday people, Instagram models are being censored as much as sex workers. And I really want to look at this. So tell me, give me a list if you know, Uh, send me some people that you know that are being censored. If you are being censored, I want to hear from you as well. And I just want to continue this conversation because I think it's going to be really interesting in how this plays out, especially if a new platform comes to the surface. I think it'll be really interesting. So let me know your thoughts and I, I want to hear from you and comment, like, share, whatever you do and tell me what you think. I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation as time goes on. So I'll be back. There's going to be more to talk about. <laughs> My favorites, constitutional law and sex and the internet and sex workers. You know, I love this stuff. And I thank you for listening and I thank you for being here. And I'm really excited to start this journey and of podcasting, you know, what'd you think? (laughs) What'd you think? Okay. I think that's enough for today. Thank you for listening and I'll, I'll speak and see you soon.